Well, that, that to some, you know, to, to a very large extent, I think, was the important political background. You know, Americans kind of feeling impotent and feeling, again, like they're losing control, wanting a politician of more decisive leadership. It's curious, though, that almost right up to the final polls, people thought that Carter actually had a good chance of winning, that the election was very close. You know, in retrospect, we like to think, oh, well, it was simple. Reagan won because this, 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 and this. The, the thing about polls, though, they're never fully reliable. You know, people sometimes tell pollsters what they think they want to hear. And it's true that the media had been telling the public for years that Reagan was this kind of crazy ideologue, somewhat out of control, reckless, a warmonger, dangerous, etc. So that a lot of people may not have wanted to admit that they were going to vote for Reagan. In the end, he won by 8 million votes. I mean, it was a landslide, despite the fact, again, that the polls were running very close. How did he actually emerge onto the stage? Because it did shock a lot of people. I mean, where did he come from? Was he really this extremist that people said he was? I may have already mentioned a, a few things about Reagan's background, you know, which are both unique and interesting. You might have seen Back to the Future. Yeah, you know, there's a funny scene where uh, uh, the Michael J. Fox character, whatever his name is, I don't know, you know, the young guy, he goes back in time. 30 years, from 1985 to 1955, and he sees Doc Brown, who still looks the same, you know, as he supposedly does 30 years later. He just has a bit more hair. And anyway, you know, they have this joke. Like, he says, well, if you're really from the future, tell me who's president in 1985. And he says, Ronald Reagan. The actor? He says, yeah, and I'm sure you're going to tell me. And then he drops a list of names. Like, it'd be, I don't know, a contemporary version. Like, oh, yeah, and Brad Pitt is probably the Secretary of State, right? And Angelina Jolie is Secretary of Defense. It seems totally preposterous. Well, maybe in a way it was. It's not really that surprising, though, if you think about democratic politics, that someone from Hollywood would necessarily do well. I guess these days... We take it more in stride when someone like Arnold Schwarzenegger, the Terminator, becomes governor of California. Clint Eastwood, incidentally, has also had a little bit of a political career. He was uh, the mayor of a town called Carmel in California for a while. And although he's by no means a kind of uh, far-right type, he has tended to support the Republicans most of the time, like he campaigned for McCain several years ago. It's curious that the people in Hollywood who tend to succeed in politics come from the right, whereas like nine out of ten people in Hollywood are on the left. It's a curious fact, but one that you can't really deny. And maybe it has something to do with almost, you might call it like the contrarian impulse. You know, someone like Reagan learning to define his views in opposition to the mainstream. In some ways strengthening him because he realized that his views were unpopular. You know, that he realized that it would take courage to stand by his principles even while people were always denouncing him. The irony, of course, is that he is known now as supposedly this patron saint of the right and of conservatives. Although, in his early days, he was not only a Democrat, he was actually a union leader. In fact, he was the only president or chief of a union ever to be elected president in American history. Ironic? Maybe. Which union was he president of? Well, the actors' union, of course. In other words, he negotiated on behalf of the other actors. The first thing you want to know about this is that it's important because he learned how to negotiate. He learned how to do business. As he later said, again, like a lot of his jokes are funny, but they always have a point to them. You know, he said, you know, handling Gorbachev was nothing like taking care of the studio heads. In other words, he had butted heads with like the richest, most powerful heads of Hollywood studios earlier in his career. So to him, dealing with the Soviets was, eh, you know, no big deal. You know, he dealt with the studios in Hollywood, you know, and they didn't mess around. The other thing that he learned, though, in this period, because when he really got involved in the union, it was like the 40s and 50s. So it was against this backdrop of, you know, controversies about communist infiltration in Hollywood, uh, the McCarthy era, as it's usually summarized, even though it actually predated the rise of McCarthy. The, the real sort of damage, so to speak, was actually done in the late 1940s uh, by a committee called uh, HUAC. Uh, it, it's a funny sort of an acronym, the House Committee on un-American, wait a minute, un-American activities, House Committee, House, 
Well, anyway, somehow they, they turned this into HUAC, the House Committee on Un-American Activities. The House Un-American Un Activities Committee, I guess. Anyway, so it was called HUAC. And this was the committee that sort of got into people's business and started holding hearings on communist infiltration, not only in Hollywood, but like, that's where the real headlines were, because that's what people were interested in. So the knock on Reagan from the left was that he had, quote unquote, collaborated with the studios. But that wasn't really true. He was the head of the union, so he was in an adversarial position with the studios. However, he was in a position to know about communist infiltration of Hollywood because, of course, they infiltrated the union. So that, on the one hand, he didn't like the greed of the studios. On the other hand, he saw what the communists were up to. So he had no illusions about this. You know, so that he didn't like the way the studios might blacklist someone who had like a communist background, but he also didn't like the way the communists kept their own lists and retaliated against people they didn't like. So he had no illusions about politics. I mean, in some ways, he was already playing hardball even back when he was an actor. And yes, he was not maybe the greatest actor in history. I mean, he was a classic what they might call a B-movie actor. You know, that is, he wasn't like a top leading man. He was someone who just acted the parts and showed up on time and got paid. You know, his, he had a couple of famous roles, one in this movie about American football, this, this phrase that people later used, you know, it was like a nickname for him. It was like, you know, some guy had died and they wanted to win the game for this guy and they called it win one for the Gipper, they called it. And so that was one of his nicknames. Uh, anyway, it was sort of a famous movie. He was famous enough, like people knew his name, but like he wasn't like a star like a Humphrey Bogart kind of a star. And so partly for that reason, I think he did eventually decide that he had an alternative future, you know, possibly in politics. For a while, he actually, he was having more and more trouble getting parts as he got older. So he took on a job with the General Electric Company. He was kind of like a, you know, like a corporate PR guy for a while. You know, he gave speeches, basically. But, you know, being, I think, more curious than some, he would go around and actually work on the factory floor. He would talk to the workers. He found out what their concerns were. And contrary to what he expected, the concerns were not all about things like, you know, wages and hours and industrial warfare and strikes and things like that. A lot of them shared his concerns about communism. And a lot of them also shared some of his concerns about, like, rampaging taxation. The issue of taxes, in some ways, was Reagan's signature issue. He had a particular understanding of this that came from his background as an actor. Now, what's something like this? If you have taxes at the top bracket, and in the 1950s, the top bracket was 90%, literally. Theoretically, if you made above a certain amount of money, you were supposed to pay 90% of it to the government, which sounds crazy. And yes, in practice, very few people did pay that much. Part of the reason, though, was because everyone had an incentive to hide or cheat on the government, you know, to hide their activity, to, uh, to deposit the money in kind of offshore bank accounts. Or, and this was the curious thing, Reagan noted that a lot of actors simply wouldn't work. If you did like one or two movies a year, you already made enough money where if you made another one, you'd tip into the highest tax bracket and they would just keep all the money anyway, so there's no point in working. This is true even today. Uh, taxes tend to hit the self-employed more than the independently wealthy. You know, that is people who are just born into money, they don't have to pay a lot of taxes. It's kind of unfair in a way. You know, they have ways of sitting on property. You know, their tax might be in the form, their, their money might be in the form of real estate. There are small taxes on real estate, but they're not that high. It might be in the form of overseas property, which isn't taxed at all. It might be in the form of inheritance money, which you can somehow slosh through without paying taxes on. People like doctors, engineers, actors, the self-employed, they have to pay much higher taxes. So Reagan had an experience of this. He also saw what was happening as this great inflation began in the 1960s. The phrase that people used, it was called bracket creep. A tax bracket meant you were like in the low bracket or the medium one or the high one. Well, let's say the high bracket kicked in at like $50,000. Well, that was a lot of money in 1958. It wasn't a lot of money in 1978 because the value of money had plummeted. If you're running at almost 20% annual inflation without changing the tax rules, people who are not rich at all are now paying the tax rates of the rich. You know, as Reagan liked to call this, this was kind of taxation without legislation. It was unfair, it was undemocratic, no one wanted it, no one had voted for it. This was the kind of issue, again, where it sounds abstract, but it hit people right in the pocketbook. 
And so we had an issue which eventually resonated with the voters. To some extent, though honestly, none of this would have meant all that much if Reagan hadn't had both the acting background, the charm, and the charisma. And then finally, a kind of almost like a gut instinct for hot button issues that people cared about. The thing that I think really brought him to national prominence as a politician uh, were his confrontations with the hippies in California. <laughs> and this is kind of fun. From about 1966 to 1974, he was the governor of California, the same position that the Terminator, Arnold Schwarzenegger, recently held. Again, not surprising, he's already there, Los Angeles, Hollywood, he's popular, he runs for governor, and to everyone's surprise, he wins. He was not particularly successful as a governor. In fact, oddly, he even raised taxes as a governor simply because you know, he realized that spending was out of control and he had to. Um, as governor, though, even though he didn't accomplish much in kind of legislative terms, he came to national prominence because he sort of stood up to the student protesters in California. Which, it's not like, again, he's standing up to the Soviets exactly. But the student protesters were frankly starting to get on people's nerves. You think about it this way. You have an unpopular war, yes, in Vietnam. You understand a lot of people are protesting. But the students aren't fighting there, right? They all have deferments. They're not the ones who are at war. They're not doing their military service. They're not going to do their military service. They're not going to Vietnam. And meanwhile, a lot of them are not protesting the war. A lot of them are protesting things like, I want better grades, and you know, I don't want to work so hard, and we should have more free time, and you shouldn't punish us if we skip class. I mean, things like this. The so-called free speech movement in Berkeley it started off, yes, as a kind of political, idealistic sort of a thing, but eventually it got into students occupying administration buildings, you know, that is like shutting down the university, really for no other reason than just because it kind of felt good to do it. I mean, it got to the point where like in the 1990s, uh, at one point they actually took over at Berkeley, where I did my, my graduate degree, you know, they took over Sproul Hall, like the administration building, and then they literally barred the doors from the inside. Uh, this was some protest to do with affirmative action. So you could call it civil disobedience, but a lot of this stuff was just literally illegal. And a lot of people thought, well, why aren't you sending these students to jail? They're a bunch of spoiled brats anyway. It's true, most of them were kind of rich, and they're going to a public school, so they're not even paying tuition. They had it easy. They had the good life, and instead of appreciating this, they were kind of ingrates. That's how the public began to see it particularly the working classes. And, and this is where something, I think, got very interesting about Reagan. There was this phrase, they called them Reagan Democrats. In a way, Reagan was the original Reagan Democrat, because he himself was a Democrat before he became Republican. You know, these were just your ordinary people. You know, maybe they had factory jobs, maybe they had some other sort of job but where they had to work hard, they hadn't been to college, they paid their taxes, they went and served in the wars, and then they heard these sort of like rich, spoiled brats whining and complaining all of the time. Well, Reagan stood up to them, but like in a really funny way. His advisors told him, like, you shouldn't get messed up in this stuff. This is just going to hurt you. You know, there's, there's no win. And instead, Reagan would go and he would actually talk to the protesters. And like, he would sort of like tell jokes. And initially, they would all, you know, shout things at him. Like, at one point, they told him, like, we're going to give you a bloodbath. And his response to this was, yeah? well, I think you should start by taking a bath. <laughs> because, of course, they're all hippies. So, like, they don't take baths, and they don't brush their teeth. You know, they all have beards and all the rest of it. So he would start to poke fun at them. Like, he would say something like, their signs say, make love, not war. But from the looks of them, I don't think they could make much of either. <laughs> uh, one of them was, what was it, uh, you know, he smells like Tarzan and he walks like Cheetah. He had all these great little put-downs for everybody. But they were sort of gentle. He was on the one hand standing up to them, but it's not like he was actually doing anything violent. Once or twice he did call in the National Guard, you know, basically to restore order at the universities. Mostly he got a lot of publicity. You know, he was seen as funny, as charming, as someone who both, you know, took the problem seriously, but kind of not too seriously. Now, like, at one point, um, everyone, <laughs> Reagan was like walking down this line, you know, past all these protesters who were all giving him the silent treatment. You know, they were just like, oh, God, that evil Reagan. So he finally just walked up, like, to, you know, the, the one who seemed like he was in charge, and he said, shh, 
And everyone broke out laughing like they didn't even mean to. You know, he was just, he was funny. Or another time, you know, they all, they were holding up these placards talking about how, you know, they were the future. And, and so Reagan, he was passing by in his limousine and he wrote down on a piece of paper. He said, I'm going to sell my bonds, he said. And he put that up in the window. <laughs> so, you know, he had a sense of humor. He was funny about things. The line about detente was a good example. It was the sort of folksy line which played well with the public, but there was a point behind it. Why are we giving money to the Soviets? What are they giving us in return? Well, they sent us some emigres. That was it. In, ex in exchange for that, they got to build a bunch of nuclear weapons. In exchange for that, they got to win the war in Indochina and eventually spread into Africa and eventually invade Afghanistan. And we hadn't even retaliated in the slightest way. You know, so his speeches, they began to touch on slightly more serious themes as he was getting older and more mature. But the sense of humor, the kind of folksy, breezy mentality was still there. That's one of the reasons why eventually I think people didn't believe when the press was, uh, kept telling the voters, well, look, you know, this guy's crazy, he's a warmonger. But he didn't seem that way. And he was cheerful. And he was funny, he was an actor. There was some steel behind his words, but there was still charm. So for a while then, he was really just kind of in the wilderness. This period that I talked about from about 74 to 1980, when you know, Nixon resigns, the Ford era, and then the Carter era, basically he was like a man without portfolio. You know, he had served his two terms, he was governor of California, he no longer had a job. Basically he gave a lot of speeches on the radio, that's how he supported himself. He gradually developed his philosophy, he did a lot of studying and reading. You know, people always joked that he was illiterate and he was like a bumpkin. And it's true, he wasn't exactly an intellectual. I mean, like he, he went to some small little college called Eureka and even there he barely passed. You know, he got like D's pretty much. But that's because he wasn't really interested in school. When he was older, he actually did some serious reading. You know, he read Milton Friedman and some of the Chicago School Economists. He read Soviet dissidents like Solzhenitsyn. And he also began really studying the Soviet system and how it worked. And he would also tell jokes, of course, about the Soviets, like he told jokes about everything. You know, one of the best of them was, um, it was the one about the man, you know, who goes to, um, you know, the car dealer in the Soviet Union and, you know, he, he orders a car. And, you know, he's told, well, okay, you know, it'll be ready in 12 years. And the man says, okay, well, you know, morning or afternoon. And the guy says, what are you talking about? It's 12 years from now. And he says, well, the plumber's coming in the morning. <laughs> 12 years from now. <laughs> anyway, these sorts of jokes showed that he had a kind of intuitive grasp of what actually happened in the Soviet Union. Um, so he told a lot of jokes, he told stories, he talked about detente, you know, he talked about basically how the Carter administration was just rolling over and playing dead. And then he gradually developed this reputation I talked about for being someone who was tough. Uh, they were again talking about the old phrase, which was rollback. That is, they weren't just going to contain communism or stop it, but actually roll it back. And this is in some ways, I think, the most interesting thing about Reagan. Yes, he was not, again, by the classic definition, an intellectual. You know, he was not someone who was necessarily like, moved by ideas in the way we think of like, college professors and writers and that sort of thing. He did write his own speeches until he became president, then he had a team of speechwriters. But he had an amazing instinct for things. By around 1980, when all of these crises are coming to a head and America's position in the world seems to be collapsing, People had kind of forgotten about even what the containment doctrine was supposed to be about. This happens. I mean, people forget what the original idea was supposedly about. If you remember Kennan, the containment doctrine going back to the late 40s, it was to apply pressure at all points upon the Soviet Union and its satellites and allies so that they cannot expand further. People remembered that. What they didn't remember was that Kennan had also explained that by applying this pressure, eventually the Soviet Union would collapse because it was unnatural. You know, it was like a police garrison state, you know, which was true. East Germany by this point, it's a, good, it's a good example of what I mean. East Germany had a population in the late 1980s of about 17 million. Of those, one million were Red Army soldiers. So like one out of every 17 people in East Germany is a, a Russian occupying soldier, right? That's not natural, it's not normal. You know, you can maintain it, I suppose, if you're willing to pay for it and keep maintaining this garrison state. That was true in an even, you know, I think, larger sense in the Soviet Union itself. 
where in the 1970s, people were, be we didn't know completely everything that was going on in the Soviet Union. They still had like a blanket over things. But, you know, that said, in the early 60s, they did begin allowing the first tourists into the country. They set up the in-tourist agency. Yes, it's true that if you were a tourist, you had a minder from the KGB who would follow you wherever you went. But that said, if you looked hard enough, you could begin to see. Now, it's not that Reagan visited the Soviet Union, but he talked to people who had. He talked to dissidents. And unlike a lot of people, he actually listened to what they said. Uh, one dissident, I'll give you an example, um, Vladimir Bukovsky. Uh, Bukovsky later became very close friends with Reagan. Bukovsky was this extraordinarily courageous, if not stubborn, Soviet dissident. You know, he was arrested like 15 times. You know, they sent him to prisons. They sent him to gulag camps. They sent him to labor camps. They sent him to psychiatric hospitals. This is the other thing that the Soviets would do. They classified dissent as a mental illness. You know, that is, if you oppose the government, you must be mentally ill. Then they would literally, like, inject drugs into your buttocks. We know all about the details because people like Bukowski, he was later traded for like a Soviet spy that did one of those, you know, like you, you set him up on the bridge. Uh, this is in Switzerland. Like, you know, he, he was traded basically. So we later learned his stories. You know, he wrote his autobiography. And this is the kind of thing, again, it was like the autobiography was out there, but not everyone read it. You know, Reagan did. He paid attention to what people like Bukowski were saying about the Soviet Union. Saying, for example, that the Soviet economy was not just you know, massively distorted because of the state involvement in everything. But it had literally become dependent, he said, on the gulag. You know, that is literally on slave labor. You know, that it could not maintain its growth rates such as they were. He basically said the growth rates were false. But that mostly the whole thing depended on coercion. You know, the whole thing depended on the state's ability to lock up and imprison dissidents, to hide statistics. It wasn't just that they, they lied about things like economic growth. They lied about the weather. I mean, I kid you not, weather was considered a state secret in the Soviet Union. So they did not publish weather reports. It was a state secret. They covered up everything. They lied about everything. I mean, this eventually became, I think, crystal clear to the world with the famous Chernobyl accident, you know, when they tried to lie and cover it up, and then it became, this is, of course, you know, the nuclear fallout from the reactor at Chernobyl in 1985. By that point, people had finally started to realize, you know, just how many distortions there were in the Soviet system and economy, how much the government was lying about this or that. Now, the, the phrase that one wag came up with was that the Soviet Union, despite its formidable appearance, you know, with this huge arsenal of uh, nuclear missiles, with the nuclear navy, which now, you know, circumnavigated the globe, with the, the, the largest army in the world, you know, five million men under arms, it wasn't that it wasn't real. It's just that all of this had been basically purchased at, at a price of a non-existent consumer economy. You know, as Gorbachev put it later, you know, it's like, well, we can, we can send men into outer space, but we can't build a refrigerator that works. You know, or like the famous exploding televisions, you know. <laughs> or my other famous example, the Soviet joke was, well, their computers are much faster than ours, but ours are bigger. <laughs> anyway, by this point, if you were paying close enough attention, you knew all this. Amazingly, though, most people weren't paying attention. The CIA famously you know, overestimated the strength of the Soviet economy right up to the end. But more than that, you wouldn't, you wouldn't think this, but Western economists were almost unanimous in saying that Soviet growth rates were not only impressive, but were sustainable. Now, they're all saying this. Samuelson Solo, the same people who encouraged Kennedy to debase the currency, were also saying that a planned economy could work. They're all on record in the 1980s as saying the Soviet Union is going to endure you know, almost forever. And it wasn't as if they didn't have company. That's what pretty much everyone thought. I mean, there are all these wonderfully embarrassing quotes. Like, I think Samuelson, Paul Samuelson, actually said this as late as, like, March 1989. You know, that the Soviet Union was, like, due to endure at least for another few decades. Um, there was a German historian who said the same thing about East Germany in 1989. And later on, everyone said, well, but see, it took all of us by surprise. None of us really expected that the U.S. would win the Cold War, et cetera, et cetera. But that's not true. Reagan was saying in the 1970s that the Soviet Union was doomed to disappear. He said in a speech in 1981, he said, look, 
Pretty soon, we will all dismiss the Soviet Union and the planned socialist economy as a strange, barbarous relic. He basically said that. We're going to consign it to the dustbin of history. Why did he believe that? I think it's one of those cases where, in a way, being an intellectual doesn't help you. The fact that he was just kind of like an ordinary person who told jokes, in a curious way, I think helped him to understand the Soviet Union better. Like a guy like Bukowski was, okay, he was much more brilliant than Reagan was. You know, he was one of these like Russians who, you know, like played chess when he was one years old, you know, just like brilliant, brilliant guy. But he respected Reagan once he got to know him because he realized that Reagan, while not brilliant, he kind of cut through the BS. You know, he got right to the fundamental essence of the thing. This wasn't just true in foreign policy. I talked about how, well, I suppose the biggest foreign policy success was the release of the hostages from Iran, which happened merely by virtue of him being elected. Within another day of his uh, inauguration in 1981, um, he ended the, essentially, energy crisis. How? He simply abolished the price controls. You know, they were trying to control the price of gasoline by, like, setting prices and targets. He just abolished the price controls. And if you look at these charts here, you can see um, oil prices. I'll look at your graph here. You can see the peak. You know, the peak wasn't all Carter's fault. A lot of it had to do with the Iran-Iraq war with the, Iran, the Iranian hostage crisis. Oil prices shot through the roof until 1981 when they suddenly tumbled straight down. How did that happen? Reagan abolished energy price controls in the United States, which was the world's leading market. There was more to it than that? Yes. That was simple. I mean, that was pretty easy. So was the Iranian hostage thing. All I had to do was get elected. I don't want to make it sound like it was easy, though, because the rest of the policies which eventually turned around the fortunes of the U.S. and the Cold War, and particularly the U.S. economy, were much harder. In retrospect, they sound simple. There was the whole business of the tax cuts. You know, I talked already about this phenomenon, this sort of the moral argument behind it. You need to lower taxes because, basically because of the inflation. There were a lot of people who weren't that rich who were paying very high taxes. There was literally, there was like a populist tax revolt. In the state of California, where things at least used to begin in America, they literally had a voter proposition called 13. California has, uh, it's one of the reasons why it's bankrupt today. <laughs> they, have, they have all these provisions for like direct democracy. The voters themselves propose laws and vote on them. And the voters were so fed up with taxes that they literally voted themselves, you know, tax decreases. Unfortunately, they didn't also vote to decrease spending, and so basically California is now bankrupt. But that said, there was a huge popular impulse behind this. Reagan succeeded in pushing through Congress you know, a sweeping tax cut. The top rate was cut from 70 to 50% in 1981. Five years later, they dropped it again to 28%. This was just the top rate. They lowered taxes for the middle and the lower brackets as well. Um, in some ways, this represented thinking that was called... Um, the supply side, I think I wrote that up here, right, the supply siders, um, a kind of a controversial school that, it's true they disagreed with the Keynesians, but in some ways they also disagreed with the anti-Keynesians. Uh, the Keynesians, basically, their position, which I've talked about, you know, this notion, the orthodox Keynesian notion that you're supposed to, in times of recession, stimulate the economy by running deficits and having loose monetary policy, of course, the part that some of the Keynesians forgot was that in times of surplus, or at least of growth, you're also supposed to reduce spending. That's what no government ever does. But the Keynesians, remember, had these notions about inflation and employment, and they, of course, opposed Reagan through and through. But they didn't oppose him just because of the tax cuts, because curiously, if you think about it, tax cuts actually go along with Keynesianism, right? You're supposed to stimulate the economy. The reason they didn't support this, though, was because Reagan backed up his tax cuts with a hard money policy. In Keynesian terms, it was nonsense. Hard money and low taxes. Low taxes kind of stimulate economic activity. Hard money depresses it. Like, if you're looking at this from the perspective of orthodox Keynesian economics, it's kind of like you're driving a car, and you're hitting the gas pedal, but you're also hitting the brakes, right? It doesn't make sense if you think in Keynesian terms. Yeah? What is hard money? Sorry? Hard money. Okay, what hard money meant was, first of all, that they stop printing money, which they always do quietly, and second, that they keep interest rates high. In other words, you make it harder to borrow money. 
Now, in the international currency markets, this also has the effect of strengthening the currency. Basically, because if you can earn a lot of interest on savings in dollars, you're going to keep your money in dollars, or other people might also buy dollars. If you can make like 20% in dollars and only 10% in pounds, you're going to buy the dollar. So it's kind of a hard money or a strong money policy. Which again, if you think as a Keynesian, doesn't make sense because he's also lowering taxes, which is supposed to stimulate the economy. That isn't really how Reagan thought about it though. He thought tax rates should be lowered simply because they were too high. He wasn't really doing it to necessarily stimulate the economy in Keynesian terms. He just thought it was the right thing to do because tax rates were so high that they were suppressing economic activity. In some ways though, the hard money policy was more important. And here's where it gets a little trickier. Monetary policy, of course, is not controlled by the president. Indirectly, however, it can be. What it comes down to is this. The Federal Reserve and its chairman has the capacity to determine monetary policy. But then, of course, the Federal Reserve chairman, currently Bernanke, who I've talked about a lot, he can, of course, get fired. Right? So to some extent, he is susceptible to political influence. Now, interestingly, there's a parallel with current times in Obama and Bernanke. Bernanke was not appointed by Obama. He was appointed by Bush. Obama kept him. Presumably, some kind of deal was cut. I get to keep my job, but I'll kind of do what you want. There's always something going on in the background. And this is why Bernanke has been famously loose you know, with quantitative easing, printing money, because the party in power, the Democrats, of course, want things that way because they want to stimulate the economy. They're still thinking in kind of traditional Keynesian terms. Now, Reagan didn't do that. Paul Volcker, who had been appointed by Carter, had already in kind of Carter's last year begun hinting at a harder monetary policy. The trick was this, when it really hit, it was going to bite. Inflation is easy to start, it's very difficult to end. Inflation was still running at 20%. That's why interest rates were so high. I mean, part of that is just because otherwise people won't even keep a money in a bank, right? I mean, if the dollar is losing its value at 20% a year, you're not going to keep your money in the bank unless your bank offers you 20% interest so that you can just barely stand still. Here's the problem though, with an interest rate that high, if you can look at this graph, the last one in your chart, you look at how high the interest rates were by the end of the 1970s, by the time Reagan took office. They were up at about 20%. Volcker was trying to keep them high. There's always though political pressure to lower them because it will stimulate economic activity. It makes it easier to lend money, to borrow money, so it stimulates economic activity. But here's the problem. If you lower these interest rates, it's like a soft money, loose money policy. It's like what we have right now with dollars sloshing around the world that are just being printed basically by the Federal Reserve, which then uses them to monetize the debt. They weren't doing that under Volcker. Volcker kept them high. And boy, did it bite. Inflation finally just barely started to creep down in the early 1980s in Reagan's first sort of couple of years in office. Just barely. It did begin, if you can see on this dollar index, gold prices, as you can see also, began finally to drop. The dollar strengthening gold prices dropping. It happened over a period of about four years, from like around 1981 to 1985, when if you remember this peak, the dollar finally hits its peak, gold prices hit a trough, and oil prices hit a trough. It took four difficult years to get there, though. In 1982 to 1983, there was a terrible, crushing recession in the United States. Unemployment temporarily went up from 7 to 11%. So more than 10% unemployment. You know, when people remember the Reagan years, even the critics of Reagan like to say, oh, well, there was this great economic boom, yes, but it was also greed and, you know, yada, yada, yada. What everyone forgets is that Reagan's first term was painful and was mostly marked by a debilitating recession, a recession deliberately brought about by Volcker's hard money policy. Reagan was told again and again by his advisors, by Congress, by the Democrats, by the Republicans, by just about everybody, that you have to do something. 
You have to stimulate the economy. You have to loosen monetary policy. You, know, you have to dramatically ramp up government spending on stimulus projects, kind of like they did a year or two ago with the $800 billion stimulus. Reagan said no. Reagan said, we will, quote, stay the course. Now, this is interesting because if you remember, Nixon had the same option in 1970. You remember what Nixon said? He said, oh yeah, we should cool off the economy. I remember 1958, we cooled off the economy and we cooled off about 50 Republican congressmen at the same time. Well, in the midterm elections of 1982, the Republicans lost 25 or 30 seats. Again, it often happens, the party in power, people are angry, so they vote out the party in power. The Republicans, again, a little bit like right now, where the Democrats lost the House last fall, but they still have the Senate, they did just barely hold on to the Senate, but they were shellacked, basically. They got crushed in the House of Representatives, which usually represents a more direct measure of public opinion. We also know, in terms of like his approval ratings, that... At the trough of the recession, Reagan was running at 35%, even below where Obama was, you know, until he, he's gotten this kind of blip now because of, you know, getting bin Laden. So he was deeply unpopular, 35%. This is why everyone was telling him you have to do something. His policy, and he literally called it staying the course, that is, the policy of not doing anything. I mean, this used to be considered a virtue, the policy of stasis. Sometimes it's better not to do anything. Um, where did he get the strength from? I mean, that I think is in some ways the really interesting question because it's not easy to carry out a policy like this. Some of it was his conviction, but interestingly, I think an odd accident of Reagan's first term was what happened really, again, right after he was elected and the Iranian hostage crisis ended and then he you know, ended the energy crisis. A couple of weeks after that, he was shot. And that was bad news. On the other hand, he survived. Who shot him, incidentally? Does anyone know the story? Uh, it's way before your time, but I didn't know if because sometimes this happens, this odd thing. This guy called John Hinckley, who was in love with Jodie Foster. You know Jodie Foster, the actress? So his way of winning Jodie Foster's attention and affection was to try to assassinate the president. So anyway, he tried to kill Reagan. It wasn't like he was, you know, a, a liberal opponent of Reagan. It wasn't anything political at all. It was just like a fame thing. But here's what was interesting. Not only did Reagan kind of get this like sympathy vote from everyone because, you know, he'd just been shot. And, of course, you never want to say a bad thing about someone who's just been shot. But he again showed his sense of humor. It was great. They wheeled him into the operating room. And, like, with the camera running, he, he looked at all the doctors and he said, well, I sure hope you're all Republicans. <laughs> and it's just, of course, everyone laughed and everyone thought, oh, wow, this is really funny. You know, the man is actually like telling a joke in the face of just being shot. And it wasn't like he was a spring chicken. And the man was 70 years old and he had just been shot. And he's telling jokes. So, again, some of it was conviction, some of it was strength. And maybe he started to think, again, that, like he had a little bit of providence on his side or something. But so here was the thing. He stuck it out. Low approval ratings, debilitating recession. It wasn't just this. Everything was like coming together in those years, 1982, 1983, Reagan's first term. Um, we'll get more into foreign policy and the Soviets next week, but the, uh, the, the key sort of uh, tension crux moment in his confrontation with the Soviets in his first term was occurring. It had to do with the Soviets' um, uh, stationing of the SS-20 intermediate range missiles in Europe. Um, the West Germans and the British had asked the Americans to station their own mid-range missiles in Europe, the so-called Pershings, although there were also some Tomahawk missiles. And anyway, the idea was, again, to counter the Soviet move with like a counter move. And of course, Reagan did it. He wanted to stand tough with the Soviets. And boy, was there hell to pay. Something like two million people came out to protest in Europe. And of course, you know, politics being what they were, they weren't protesting the Soviets who were threatening to kill them. They were protesting Reagan who was trying to defend them. That's just the way things work, I guess. The idea was, again, that Reagan was a warmonger because he was standing up to the Soviet Union, whereas it would have been better just to let the Soviets, you know, basically kind of knuckle under Europe. The Soviet strategy, again, not being literally that they wanted to annihilate the Europeans, but that by eliminating the American security deterrent, they could eventually absorb Europe and sort of, as the phrase went, um, Finlandize it, turn it into Finland. You know, that is, Finland, which no longer had an independent foreign policy, it had to do with the Soviets said. 
The Soviets were also, of course, building oil pipelines to Europe, and so their idea was a combination of blackmail and threats, not really the carrot and the stick, more like the stick and the stick. They could then turn the Europeans, split NATO in half, peel off the Europeans from the NATO alliance. That was the strategy. So, when I'm talking about protests, I mean, literally, the count was two million people. And yes, the Soviets had kind of a hand in it, you know, their front organizations are organizing some of the, the peace rallies. But there was also a lot of genuine sentiment behind it. There was a lot of real resentment of Reagan in Europe. You know, not unlike what happened with, with Bush in the Iraq invasion. You know, seen as a warmonger, the cowboy, all the same language was used. Only then it was actually worse. Because in the early 1980s, it wasn't just a matter of, you know, opposing American hegemony or whatever. It was a matter of fear of nuclear war. I mean, it was really serious stuff. I mean, in some ways, people are nostalgic for the Cold War sometimes because it seems like things were kind of clearer then. But on the other hand, the part people have forgotten is, of course, the threat of nuclear holocaust. The fact that, you know, Americans used to do these drills where, like, you would go and, like, hide under the desk. You know, in case it didn't make any sense. I mean, how are you going to survive a nuclear blast by hiding under a desk? But, like, that's what they would do in the classrooms. They had all these drills, you know, in case of, like, nuclear attack. The 1980s, too, particularly, again, this early tense time in Reagan's first term, you know, there was a whole spate of, like, nuclear Armageddon movies. There was this one called The Day After, you know, which was, again, just what would happen if the nuclear bombs went off. Uh, there was one called The Miracle Mile, um, which was set in Los Angeles. And, you know, the premise is you learn that the world is going to end tomorrow. What do you do? You know, do you do go spend one last night with your girlfriend? You know, do you go tell your parents you love them? You know, what do you do? These movies were all over the place. It was like a whole genre of, like, nuclear holocaust, you know, sort of fear-mongering in the early 1980s. And, of course, in the West, most of it, oddly, was actually directed against Reagan. And in a way, you can see the logic to it. The idea is, well, yeah, the Soviets are bad and we don't really like them. On the other hand, the problem is that Reagan is standing up to them. And before, it wasn't as safe because we were just kind of agreeing with them and doing what they said. And let's go back to the old way. So Reagan was deeply unpopular politically. There were millions of protesters out in the street, you know, chanting his name. It wasn't all death to America stuff like they said in Iran. You know, it wasn't that sort of thing. But it was more like... You know, end of the warmonger, the cowboy who's going to kill us all. Incredible tension in Reagan's first term. That's the part people have forgotten. He didn't let it get to him, though. He didn't let it get to him. He didn't let it bother him. And in some ways, again, this inner strength, what's interesting about it to me is I think it also has to do with, I keep coming back to this metaphor, you know, of like the large dog doesn't have to bark and the small dog has a loud bark. In Reagan's case, it wasn't just that he had a reputation for toughness was that in a curious way, he also didn't care that much what people thought. I think about it like this way. A politician like Clinton was in some ways the opposite. You know, he had certain strengths. On the other hand, like, he cared what people thought. He wanted to be loved. He wanted to be liked. You know, he was charming. He had, like, a nice touch with people. He enjoyed affection. He enjoyed adulation. He wanted to make sure people said nice things about him in the papers. Reagan didn't really care. It was probably because he'd been a Hollywood actor. You know, it's kind of like, if you've been a Hollywood actor and you've had basically like the glamour of your Hollywood set party from the time you were 20 years old, you're not really going to be all that impressed by like what some Washington society hostess thinks of you. You're not going to care if the New York Times denounces you in an editorial. You know, Reagan had a different sort of an inner strength so that he was able to withstand all of this. You now, and again, it's not that all of his policies worked or were brilliant. The consequences of the tax cuts, you know, some of them were positive. It did unleash entrepreneurial activity. You had a huge period of economic growth, which kicked off around 1983. They were called the seven fat years, you know, of economic growth of about 3.5% per year. The arms build up, you know, they did eventually, of course, as we know, sort of scare the Soviets into outspending themselves in the Cold War. The big, of course, legacy of all this in negative terms was the massive budget deficits, which were not surprising. The tax cuts weren't necessarily fatal in that, to some extent, tax revenues actually continued going up because there were fewer loopholes and people were no longer just, you know, sending their money abroad. That said, government spending went up more quickly. And so this problem that we're talking about today, the never-ending, you know, deficit, America's huge debt problem, definitely goes back to the 1980s.
You know, Reagan's argument would have been, well, it was worth it because we were fighting the Cold War. And you should have got the budget under control after the Cold War. Which actually, in some ways, they did in the Clinton era. Only, of course, in the Bush era, everything kind of went crazy again as far as the budgeting. But when it came to foreign policy and the confrontation with the Soviets, what Reagan really had, his real advantage, was very simple. It was conviction. He had no doubt that his side was in the right. Um, the first you know, evidence of this, again, at this tense time with all these protesters in Europe, was the famous Evil Empire speech of 1983. How are we doing on time, by the way? We almost... Oh, no, we do have about 10 or 15 minutes. Um, so the Evil Empire speech, which, again, sort of terrified everyone because it sounded like he was, again, promoting confrontation and war. In some ways, though, it was very simple. He said that the Soviet Union was the focus of evil in the modern world and that it was an evil empire. Well, it doesn't necessarily sound all that interesting maybe to you or me. The word evil, I guess, does have some kind of connotations. But it represented a serious shift in thinking. U.S. would no longer accommodate the Soviets. We would no longer have detente. We would no longer trust what they said. As the phrase went, it was trust but verify. You know, that is, if they tell you they're actually disarming the nukes, you don't have to tell them they're lying. On the other hand, you should make sure that they're telling the truth. Um, so it represented a policy of active confrontation. Now, in the short term, again, it was controversial. It increased tensions rather than decreasing them. And it required patience. The most interesting single fact of Reagan's first term is this. He never once actually met with the Soviet leadership. He refused to meet with them. He refused to have a summit. He refused to have a photo opportunity. He refused to make any concessions. He refused to give them any loans. That's what it meant to end detente. No more Mr. Nice Guy. And this too, of course, scared people, right? Because isn't it always better to talk than to, you know, have threats and confrontations? There was a point to Reagan's policy, though, which went something like this. In the late Carter years, it wasn't simply that U.S. arms reductions were unilateral and not reciprocated. But nothing else was reciprocated either. They had this principle. This phrase, reciprocity. You know, reciprocity basically means something that has a response, right? It's interesting that I have my own experience of this. You as Turks will very soon be able to visit Russia without even a visa, right? You've probably heard about this. I, as an American, have to pay almost $500 for, <laughs> for a, like a multi-entry business visa. Why? Because of reciprocity. Because the Americans charge the Russians a high price, the Russians charge us a high price. Yeah, it's understandable. I don't like it, but I understand where the policy comes from. Here was the problem with diplomacy between the two superpowers. The Soviets didn't just get away with a lot of thuggish behavior around the world, like, you know, invading Afghanistan without consequences. The Soviets also had very specific policies where, I'll give you an example, like the Soviet ambassador in Washington, his name was um, Dubinin, he was actually given privileged access to the White House in the Carter years. He could have you know, meetings whenever he wanted, sometimes without even intermediaries. Not with Carter always, but that is with like the Secretary of State or high government officials. The Soviets made sure that the U.S. ambassador in Russia always had to go through about five or six people before he could even get anybody on the phone. A small thing, but in an interesting sense important, because it represented, again, a lack of reciprocity. So Reagan's position was this, look, until they eliminate these you know, unequal diplomatic practices, until they offer us real arms reductions to meet our own, you know, until they offer us promises such as that they will withdraw from Afghanistan along a certain timetable, until all of this, basically these conditions are met, I won't even talk to them. Well, it sounds a little foolhardy. You can see why people might have been perturbed by the idea that there were no direct negotiations. But on the other hand, this is what it means to negotiate from strength. Why? Because Reagan perceived that in the end, and this is true even today, even with like America's diminished standing in the world, it still has a certain prestige. You know, you're still going to be a lot more excited if the American president visits your country than if, I don't know, the president of Bolivia does. You know, simply because of, again, diplomatic prestige and power. 
the Americans still, despite the idea of there being some kind of equality between the two superpowers, Reagan still understood that a summit had more the effect of legitimizing the Soviets than the Americans. The idea being the Americans didn't need summits. The Soviets did. He also knew that the Soviets needed summits and they needed diplomacy because the Soviets needed money. Again, he also knew that. America had no particular need for the Soviet Union to give it anything. America wanted, certainly, for the Soviets to reduce their arms stockpile and so on and so forth. But aside from that, America didn't need anything from the Soviet Union. Aside from, I guess, caviar, but I mean, you know, that's like a luxury that you don't worry too much about. There was one other lever that Reagan had, which was extremely important. They didn't talk about it much. Reagan didn't talk about it. In fact, whenever Reagan was asked about it, he would always do this thing like he was very good at changing the subject. <laughs> uh, there was a story about this this one time, like these, uh, uh, these guys from the shoe industry, you know, like shoe manufacturers, they're getting hammered by competition from abroad. You know, basically people are producing cheap shoes in places like, you know, obviously China, wherever, you know, Europe, Asia. And they wanted Reagan to slap new tariffs down on shoes to protect them. And they came into the Oval Office and they, they asked him basically for a big favor. And Reagan responded by talking about his favorite pair of cowboy boots and how hard it was to find cowboy boots these days. And he kept on talking about cowboy boots until they left. <laughs> you remember, this is part of this philosophy, I think, uh, yeah, Cool Coolidge had it. He said, you know, 90% of the time, people who come to the White House want something they ought not to have. If you just stand dead still, you know, for 10 minutes, they'll eventually walk out. You know, that was Reagan's position. He did the same thing once he eventually did meet with Gorbachev and Gorbachev complained about the oil price, Reagan just smiled and changed the subject. But there was menace behind the message. If you look at this chart too, again this magical year of 1985, where did this come from? The dollar index, the dollar peaks in 1985. Interest rates are falling in 1985. Easier to borrow and loan money. Crude oil prices, look at this one. The oil price, which is now, again, in kind of current dollars, uh, it hovers around $100, just the Brent price and the New York price. Somewhere between around maybe $100 and $110 today. Um, in 2008, you know, it was briefly even above that. It's gotten up close to where it was in 2008 now. Where was it in 1985? Interesting, it was about $20. It was about one-fifth, that is, of what it is today. And depending on how you measure inflation, purchasing power parity, and all of the rest of it, you can make a case that it was, in fact, even cheaper than that. 1985, historically, oil price was cheaper than it had been at any point, right, basically before uh, the, the key years in the oil industry were, you know, 1970, 71. 1970 being when American production finally started declining. America had been the world's leading producer. And then, you know, 1971, basically, Nixon went off Bretton Woods and sort of, you know, weakened the dollar. So the oil price went to, like, its low, its trough. Now, interestingly, the Soviets, the Soviets thought this was a deliberate American policy. And they were right. <laughs> As we know, of course, the Soviet Union, well, modern Russia, just like the Soviet Union, depends heavily on oil and energy exports for virtually all of its revenues. In fact, to some extent, that whole period I talked about earlier today, the Soviets on the march, you know, the 1970s, uh, Vietnam, Cambodia, you know, Africa, Asia, the Soviets expanding their influence around the world, building this, you know, world-circling nuclear-powered navy, expanding their nuclear arsenal. A lot of it was funded by this, this massive shooting up of the oil price. Some historians even, they sort of reckon that Without the Arab oil embargo of 73 and the fall of the dollar, which sent oil prices skyrocketing, the Soviet Union you know, might have fallen apart 20 years earlier than it did. It's one of those things you just don't know. I mean, who really knows? Maybe they would have gone on indefinitely, but been very poor. You know, maybe they just wouldn't have been able to pursue such an active foreign policy. No one knows, of course, the counterfactual. What we do know, though, is that this, 
this vertical shooting up of the oil price allowed the Soviets to massively expand their nuclear arsenal, to expand their influence around the world, spend money on you know, things like bribes, sending advisors, uh, getting business deals, sending $5 billion a year to Cuba to keep the Cubans on board with all of their activities in Africa. And then, of course, finally, the Soviets simply being able to buy whatever they wanted as far as like, the latest weapons for their arsenal. Then what happens? Whoop! There goes oil in the other direction. 1985, the Soviets are suddenly going broke. It was not an accident. Some of it, again, had to do with Volcker and the strong money policy, high interest rates strengthening the dollar. Some of it had to do with Reagan ending, to a certain extent, the energy crisis simply with a stroke of the pen by eliminating the price controls on gasoline. Some of it also had to do with something a little bit less savory, and that was this. Explain a little bit about the way the oil business works in terms of the prices. You know, why these graphs tend to go vertical frequently. It might be, yes, a crisis. It might be a war like the recent unrest in the Middle East. Libya, for example, some of its production going offline. Those things can obviously seriously affect international prices. Sometimes, though, governments are able to manipulate it deliberately. Again, the key year here was 1970. Until 1970, the United States basically controlled the oil price. How did they do that? It's not that they produced all of the oil. They didn't. They were the world's leading producer. But here was the key. It is what is called reserve capacity. Who has the ability to suddenly spike production. That is, if there is a crisis, right, and you're trying to stabilize the oil market, you ramp up production. In the old days, until again 1970, it was the Texas Railroad Commission. Now, it's not that it was like these guys sitting around in hats, you know, who are conspiratorially controlling the world economy. It's nothing as, as kind of like sinister or, or elite as that. It was more like you could send a signal. And here was the signal. Because the Texas Railroad Commission controlled things like freight prices and the ability of the oil producers to ship the oil, they could act as a sort of like a, what's the word, not a funnel, but, you know, they could, they could either open up the floodgates or they could close them just a little bit. They had some control, what, a sluice maybe, like a sluice gate, right. It's a little bit like a sluice gate. They can either encourage production to ramp up or they can cut off the distribution of the production that's there. It's partly transport, partly production. Now, it's not that they wanted the price to go like that. No, they were Americans. They wanted the price to go like this. You know, they wanted it to be stable and cheap. Okay? They lost control around 1970. You know, OPEC, it's not that OPEC completely controlled oil prices after that. But beginning around 1973, the country that really controlled things was, of course, Saudi Arabia. And after they nationalized oil production, it was the company known as Aramco. The Saudis have what is called reserve capacity. Whether they still have it is an open question. Nobody is really sure because Aramco does not allow anyone to examine its books. We think that they still have this reserve capacity. And most of us hope that they do because the Saudis, of course, while they do like the price to be reasonably high, they also realize if it gets high enough, the whole thing will fall apart. And so they have an interest in at least keeping things afloat in terms of global trade. In the 1980s, as we know, the Saudis were still then, as they probably are a little bit less now, under American influence. The Americans effectively acted as a kind of Praetorian guard for the Saudi government. You know, the deal being, again, basically, you will help us maintain a stable oil price in exchange. You know, we will help prop up your regime. This relationship goes back to the FDR era, way back to the 1940s. It's no great secret. I mean, everyone knows that it's there. But I guess they uh, financed the election of uh, Bush father. There's, uh, there's a possibility that that's true. What you need to know, though, is that the Saudis finance both parties and both houses of Congress, and pretty much everybody in Washington is on the payroll. <laughs> so it's not that they necessarily prefer one party over the other. The Bush family famously did have close relations with the Saudis. So do about 
a couple hundred other politicians in Washington. Now, it may, it may be true that Obama has less connections with them, and so they're not as close, and they don't have as much influence. That may well be true. The question today, of course, is whether the Saudis still have enough reserve capacity. It seems that they don't have as much as they used to, because they have not been able to keep the oil price below the level that they supposedly want. The word on the street today is that the Saudis' reserve capacity is mostly in what is called heavy crude, which is to say the oil that demands very, very involved refining before it can actually be made into petroleum. Um, but back to the 1980s, we don't know it for a fact, but there is reason to suspect that along with a strong dollar policy, along with the killing of the inflation, the Reagan administration leaned on the Saudis to ramp up production not just to help the dollar in the American economy, but to stick the screws to the Soviet Union. Um, so I think that'll do it for today. When we get back, we're going to look at the advent of Gorbachev to power and the climactic years of the Cold War. But listen, uh, this Friday, briefly, um, we will stay in touch on email about uh, Muhammad's petition to try to change the date of the final exam. Because it's Mayfest and all the rest of it, I don't think anyone will be here anyway, and so uh, we're not going to have class Friday. What we will do instead is we will have two classes next week, and then we will make it up with a review class uh, to be announced, because we're not sure yet when the final will be. Okay? Great.